And so that's this message series that we're discovering that Jesus didn't come to throw shade at us. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in John chapter 15 today. John chapter 15 is going to be our main text. And just before we get into it, I, I saw on the news this week, I don't know if you guys had seen this article, the University of North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill, the Tar Heels, uh, they did a study where they asked 511 uh, American Christians uh, a series of questions uh, about nine different categories, such as age, gender, attractiveness, race, perceived wealth, intelligence, happiness, lovingness, and powerfulness. And they asked them through a series of pictures to show them what they felt like God looked like. So God looked like based on their preferences is kind of this study. Now, just go with me here for a second, because as as a Bible-believing Christian, for someone to interview me to see what God looks like, I don't don't have to speculate based on my preferences. I, I can just go to God's Word, and I can just read what God's Word tells me God is like, because He reveals who he is in his word, and specifically what he looks like. He looks like Jesus. Jesus Christ is God's son sent into the world, God with skin on, God incarnate, God became a man, lived and died, rose from the dead, and now seats at the right hand of God the Father in victory, giving me his Holy Spirit so that I can live a victorious life. I don't need to speculate or wonder who God is. I know God because I know his word, and I want to encounter him, and I want to encourage encourage you, don't fall prey to this idea that God is whoever, who, who you think he is. He's not who you think he is or what you think that he looks like. He is who he says he is. He's the creator. He is the almighty one. He is the infinite God. He is the everlasting God. There is no beginning nor end. He is eternal from the beginning to the end. He is the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the firstborn over all creation. God almighty is the one true God. He is the creator of the ends of the earth and the infinite spans of the universe. Our God is powerful. And when we come to him, we can know him through his word. And we're going to encounter him right now. In John chapter 15, if you have a Bible, turn open to John chapter 15. And it's on the screen if you don't have one with you. Also, if you have our Living Water app, you can follow along right there in the app. It says this. Jesus speaking to his disciples. This is a very important passage. It's located in in the chapters between John chapter 13 and John chapter 17. Jesus is meeting with his disciples at the Last Supper. And he's going in detail about his kingdom and the way that he, he operates and the way that God loves us. And he says this in John chapter 15, right there nestled in the middle of this passage. He says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. I've called you friends. Friends. Is that an, uh, an amazing idea? Listen, Jesus, when he came in the world, he didn't come so that he could throw shade at us, okay? He didn't come wearing some shades, acting too cool for school, man. He didn't come in saying, okay, look, I'm Jesus, okay? And y'all are these servants over here. I'm, 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 I'm going to be watching you. I want you to do what's right. Stay in school. Don't do drugs. Listen, Jesus, he, he, he didn't come to throw shade. Listen, he came to look at us face to face as a man meets with his friends. So God came face to face with humanity and he said, I have called you friends. I've entitled today's message, Leaning into Friendship. Leaning into Friendship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, your word is truth. God, we can base our lives on the truth that you share with us. Father, the next few moments, God, would you touch my words with your Holy Spirit? Would you do something powerful in each of our lives so that we leave changed because we met with God? 
and we've encountered your presence. God, lead us into truth over these next few moments. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Leaning into friendship. You know, you know, love is the central idea to understand when you're talking about meeting or knowing God in a personal way. Jesus, he starts out this passage about friendship. He starts talking about love. He said, listen, I want you to love others if I've loved you. Greater love is no one than this that he laid down his life for his friends. He says, you love me if you do what I command. This idea of love is central to understanding who God is. We're not talking about this earthly kind of love. We're not talking an erotic kind of love or even a brotherly love. We're talking about an almighty God loving his creation unconditionally with no boundaries to his love. His love is unending. It is magnificently powerful so that it overcomes every obstacle that you and I could ever face or even anything that we could ever do. There's nothing you can do to escape from God's love. Paul the Apostle, he writes in the book of Romans, he writes this amazing passage that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Neither height nor depth nor anything in all creation nor, nor demons. Nothing has more power than God's amazing, powerful love. And when we come to God, we must understand that God is love. It's not just something he does. No, no, God is love. His posture towards us is love. But here's, as human beings, here's where we have a hard time. We live in this world that thinks that it knows what love is, but it really doesn't. And so this love of the world kind of shifts and changes. It kind of moves around. We're being tossed around. We think we know what love is, but we don't know unless we come to God through Jesus Christ. That's where we discover who love really is. God is love. And the world holds up love as a standard and says love should be pursued, but at the same time, it uses mantras like survival of the fittest, and only the strong survive, and, and only the successful are the ones who mean anything in life. And we get these mixed messages that says, but I, I thought that we, we, I thought we were about love here. I saw on the news this week on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt an article that I showed uh, some, some love that two friends had for each other. Take a look. It was an extraordinary end to a hard-fought game. Yeah. But it was this extraordinary moment that has people still cheering in St. Paul and beyond. Oh, you hug you. Pitcher Ty Kane had just struck out the final batter, sending his team to the state tournament. But before rushing to join the celebration, he ran to home plate to console his good friend, Jack Koken. Being that last out, it was really rough. And uh, to have Ty come up to me after the game, that was huge for me, because you know I need someone who's there for me, and uh, Ty was the guy. Everyone knows how it feels to be in that situation, so I felt like I, I needed to go up to him and say something, and just was spontaneous and felt like the right thing to do. The two grew up playing ball together. When we were about 13 or 14 years old, we were on a traveling baseball team, and that's where we got pretty close, and we wanted to keep in touch ever since then. They learned how to win and lose, and always put friendship first. 20 years from now, I'll think back to that game. I will not remember the score at all, but I remember what tied it for me, and that's really all that matters. That spontaneous hug was the best play of the game, a home run in sportsmanship. Man, that's good right there. That just... <laughs> I mean, that's good stuff right there. Where's, there's power in love. Jesus, in talking to his disciples, he says, you're going to know what love is because I've loved you. That's what he said. He said, go and love one another with the same love that I've loved you with. He said, this is, what you know, this is how you know what great love looks like. A man would lay down his life for his friend. We discover what love is so that we can love others by the way that God has loved us. And then here's this massive idea that he presents to them. And he says that you are now friends of God. You have the privilege of having a friendship with God Almighty. You get to walk in relationship with him and we get to explore what a friendship with God really looks like. A friendship with God really starts by us believing that Jesus Christ is the one and only payment for our sins and that we could live forever with God if we trust Jesus for our salvation. It begins with believing. 
There's this guy named Abraham. He was a pretty much a legend in the Bible. If you want to use today's terms, he's the goat. Okay, he's the greatest of all time when it comes to faith. His, his jersey is hanging retired in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. I mean, this guy had it together, but at the same time, he made some mistakes. He made some pretty serious blunders in his life. Yet, listen to what the scripture records about him in James chapter 2, verse 23. The scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You know, you know that God actually identified so much with Abraham and with Abraham's lineage that later on when God would introduce himself to people, he would pull out his business card. He would say, I'm God. I'm the God of Abraham. What if God named himself after you? I mean, God identified as a friend of Abraham so much that he actually introduced himself to people as Abraham's God. That's a powerful friendship that this man had with God. In fact, Abraham goes on to become the father of all who believe. It says this in Romans chapter 4, verse 16, that he is the father of all who believe. In fact, Abraham began three world religions from his own life. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all trace their roots back to Father Abraham. Father of many nations, father of those who would believe. I think on Father's Day, it's really important to understand to become a father, not just to produce children into this world, but to produce mighty men and women of God full of faith who know Jesus Christ intimately and they are following him with all of their hearts. I think that's a great task for a father to take on and follow in the footsteps of Abraham, our father of faith, and say, man, he got it right. I'm going to get it right. I'm going to pursue a lifestyle in my own life where those who come after me are influenced to believe. Those who come after me are influenced to believe that God is enough and that my friendship with God, my relationship with God translates on down to generations that follow. A friendship with God. You know what kind of friendship God wants you? It kind of reminds me of that song, that Bill Withers wrote in 1972 that became worldwide famous called Lean On Me. When you're not strong, I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on. For it won't be long till I'm gonna need somebody to lean on. Come on, man. Better just call on your brother. Bill Withers wrote that song in 1972. He had moved to Los Angeles from West Virginia and become very homesick for his local community that he had in his small town. And he wrote that song because he longed for that kind of friendship that he wasn't finding in Los Angeles. Listen, there's a homesickness in our hearts that each of us cry out, Abba, Father. We cry out to God, saying, God, I know that there's a relationship that I can have with you that transcends everything that I'm going through in my life. It is the anchor through every storm. It is the rock that I could build my whole life on. This friendship with God is something that's vitally important for us if we're going to fulfill God's plan for our life. But any, any friendship, any relationship... There's one key component, is a a friendship with God requires time. It takes time. Man, I've got to put time into anything that's worthwhile. If I want to have a good friendship, i got to have time invested in it. I spent some time back in the year 2000 as a short-term missionary to the island nation of Barbados. And while I was there, I had... Uh, really developed a greater understanding of really spending quality time with people. If you've ever been to an island country, uh, they, they go on island time or Barbados time, and, and they don't really show up on time to anything. So if, if somebody invites you over for dinner, hey, we're going to have dinner tonight at my house. What time? Hey, 5 p.m. And, and they're not going to serve dinner until 7 p.m. because that's when everybody's going to arrive because they're on island time. And, and the, the whole idea is, listen, we're on an island. 
You can't go anywhere. Why are you in such a hurry, bro? Slow down. Take it easy. Don't worry. Be happy. And I, I got broke free from this, this, this captivity that I had to a schedule at the time and really understood what it meant to just be in a deep relationship with some friends. Man, you get together, and we're going to make a whole evening of just spending time together playing dominoes, hanging out, man, not in any hurry at all. That's the kind of relationship that God wants with you. He wants an unhurried, take some time kind of relationship with you. And it's difficult with a hustle and bustle of life, and it's taken us so many different ways, and we've got all this information and social media and all this kind of things. Let me encourage you, before you go digital in the morning, go biblical. Before, before you open up that phone and go digital, go biblical, man. Get in God's word. Spend some time with your best friend because he sticks closer than a brother. But see, friendship with God won't be available if you're not available. If you don't make yourself available to God, God won't make himself available to you because it's really all about how much of God you want in your life. He'll fill up every place that you give him. He'll fill up every moment that you give him. I, I read, as I was studying for this message, I read that in 1977, President Jimmy Carter went on a tour where he actually went and spent the night in an average American's home. He, he would just call up somebody or his office would call up somebody. They would make arrangements. And President Jimmy Carter would come and spend the night in this person's home. I read about this one woman named Kay Thompson and her husband who were raising eight children and they had an opportunity to have the president in their home. Even so much so that they installed a red special phone for the president because they didn't have all the technology we have nowadays and so they had this old school like phone that you'd pick up a handset from a corded curly little thing. Some of y'all don't even know what that is. President Jimmy Carter came and he wrote a note for the daughter who was going to go to school the next day, who was going to be late. And he said, please excuse her because she had a guest in her home. That would be something you'd frame, right? I mean, you'd, you'd frame the president wrote you a note. I, I think that's an interesting illustration because that's what God does with us. God comes and makes his home in our hearts. He comes and lives inside of us. The Bible says that he doesn't live in a temple made by human hands. Don't, don't mind all the beautifulness of this building. It is not where God dwells. God dwells inside each of us as believers in Jesus Christ. He comes and he makes his home in us. John chapter 14, in the same portion of scripture, John 13 through 17, that the last supper here, Jesus says this in John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. You know what would happen if you had the president come and stay at your house? Don't, don't mind politics nowadays. I'm not talking about any specific politician. Please don't, don't misunderstand this analogy. If you had someone of great importance come over to your home, you'd be painting walls, replacing carpet. You'd be getting things ready. You'd be saying, we got to get the yard looking straight. Man, everything's got to be done because he's coming. Because you would want to offer hospitality. See, we ought to offer hospitality to God as he makes his home in us. We ought to create space for him and get things prepared, not so that we're putting up a facade where he doesn't see the real us. No, no, no. So that we're honoring our heavenly father. What is, it, what is it like to have God in your home? What is it like to be hospitable towards God? A hospitable host makes his guests feel warmed and welcomed as they come in. You welcome someone. You make them feel at home. They are comfortable in their accommodations. Are you doing that with God? Are you, are you eager to meet with him? I think that's a way to show hospitality to God is to say, man, I want to meet with you, God. I want to make some time for you. I want to make some space in my life for God time. I want to minister to the Lord. In Acts chapter 13, verse 2, it says that Barnabas, he, he was ministering to the Lord. The word minister means to serve someone else's needs. 
God doesn't have any needs. Listen, God doesn't have need of you or me to do anything for him. He provides everything himself. But listen, there's a heart attitude toward my friendship with God that I say, I want to minister to the Lord. I want to bless him. I want to encourage God's work in my life. I want to do something about me that's a, a good home for God to come and dwell in me. Listen, great relationships require great effort. Every great relationship that you ever had in your entire life required some effort on your behalf. If it's a marriage, if it's a friendship, if it's a father-son, mother-daughter relationship, if it's an aunt-uncle, whoever it is, co-worker, if you want to have a great relationship, you got to put some great effort into making that thing happen. It's the same thing with our friendship with God. Man, we got to put some effort towards this relationship to make sure that that relationship is everything that it ought to be. Let me tell you, when you put effort towards a relationship, it, it costs you something. And you know what the costing of a relationship does for me? It, it's good for me. It gets my heart into a place where now I'm moving in the direction where I'm more invested in that friendship. I'm more invested in that relationship. I'm more invested in that area. And so now it's more important to me because I've put something into it. Man, when it costs you something, it means more to you. And listen. That's exactly what we ought to do in our relationship with God. We ought to, what I call, sacrifice. Write this down if you're taking notes. Sacrifice strengthens relationships. Sacrifice. I'm, I'm giving something up to benefit someone else. You know, fasting and prayer is a way for us to get deeper in a friendship with God. Fasting simply means that I'm not eating food so that I can spend time with God. Man, you know what happens when you begin to fast? Man, you get empty. You feel like, wow, I am empty. I'm low on energy and I need some food. But you know what that does is it creates a spiritual hunger. It, it creates this place inside of you that all, although you're empty, you feel so full. <laughs> It's this amazing oxymoron of a, of a situation where you feel so empty, but you feel so full of God and his presence and his word as you're feasting at the table of the Lord, eating from his word and finding all of your sustenance in him. It's an amazing practice. Sacrifice, it, it might involve your time and you get involved in some work that the church is doing and you serve on one of our serving teams and your heart gets closer to God. You, you join a group and you take some time and you fellowship with other believers, you make friendships, you encourage one another in the Lord and all of a sudden you're growing closer to God. You bring your tithes and offerings to the Lord, you're sacrificing of your finances so that you can further God's kingdom. Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter Chapter 6 verse 21 he says where your treasure is there your heart will be yes. see when we put our treasure in God's work oh when we sacrifice we we get closer to God's heart our heart gets involved in God's work and then we start caring about the church more we start caring about the mission and what we're up to here we start wanting to get more involved if you feel like you're disconnected let me tell you get connected start sacrificing get closer to Jesus and I'm telling you this friendship will begin to develop and let me tell you this sacrifice this friendship goes both ways I've heard it said, I can shovel it out, but God's got a bigger shovel. Come on, somebody. Man, when you give to God, he gives back to you in a great measure. It's amazing what God does in our lives. You know, as a kid, I had some friends who, who did a lot for me, and I was really grateful for their impact in my life. I remember one kid growing up in South Georgia, it get really hot. You know, you guys in Chicagoland are making a big deal about how hot it is this weekend. Listen, this is every day in Georgia, okay? I mean, this is it. This is life. You turn on the air conditioner and you either go inside or you go sit in a pool. And man, this kid that I had a friend with as a child, he had a pool. And let me tell you, friends with a pool are cool. Man, you spend time with that dude. You're like, bro, you were my friend, and you got a pool. We play all summer long with friends with pools, man. Because you got to spend some time with them. You got, you got to say, man, I care about this friendship. As, as adults, we got other friends that maybe a friend with a truck, right? 
man, you got a friend with a truck. You better maintain that friendship right there because you're going to need a truck someday. You're going to call them up and be like, hey, bro, you want to help me move this thing? Hey, you want to take me? Friends with trucks don't let people know they have trucks. You know, they're like, pastors, start talking about trucks right now because they know, man, friends with trucks are cool, man. Let me tell you, God's got better things than just pools and trucks for you. God's friendship provides you with so much access to the things that you need to do life, the wisdom to make decisions. Oh, he's a friend who is going to share some stuff with you. He's going to say, go this way, go that way, do this thing. God has a wealth of things to give to you in a friendship, and he'll do it for you. But a friendship with God requires obedience. That's the difference between a friendship with God and a friendship with others is that a friendship with God requires obedience. Jesus says, you're my friends if you do what I command. You're you're my friends if you're walking in an obedient relationship with me. Psalm 25 verse 14 in the English Standard Version says it like this. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him and he makes known to them his covenant. A friendship with God is for those who fear him. Not a, I'm afraid of you fear, but I have a reverential respect for you as my God that I want to obey everything that you tell me to do because I know what it means to walk with God. He's powerful. His words are life. One word from God can change your entire destiny forever. You step out on that word like Peter did. Jesus said, come out on the water. And he said, all right, I'm coming. He starts walking on the water. I'm telling you, you can have miraculous experiences in your life as you trust in God's word. He gives you direction. And man, you need to have this reverential fear. Listen, is your relationship with God suffering because you're not being obedient to God? Some of our friendships are damaged with God because we've been disobeying what he's told us to do. We need to come back. It's called repentance. We need to repent, turn away from that stuff, and get back to this friendship with God that we're obeying him in a real and a powerful way. I, I want to I kind of close this message with a, with a big idea, and I need you to understand what's happening here. In the context of our passage in John chapter 15, there's this information before, and there's this information after, right here where we're talking about this friendship with God that's vitally important because it kind of pulls this whole passage together. I want you to see this for a moment. John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus said it like this. I am the vine and you are the branches. If any man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And he goes on to down verse 16 and he says it like this. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. So At the beginning of the passage, he's talking about being connected to the vine and bearing fruit. At the end of the passage, he's talking about appointment to bear fruit. So this bearing of fruit is something that's vitally important. And what does a tree do in order to bear fruit? I mean, it it just is. It doesn't have to try. It doesn't have to strive. It doesn't have to work. It just, notice the word is bear fruit. It's not even produce fruit. Because when you're connected to Jesus, fruit just, it just comes out. It, it's just a byproduct. It's just something that happens. I'm connected in a friendship with God and I, I bear fruit in my life. See, we want fruitfulness in our lives, but many times we're missing a key component. Listen to this. Fruitfulness stems from friendship. No, no, notice the passage is you're going to bear fruit if you're connected to the vine and you're going to bear fruit if I appoint you. And right in the middle of these two passages in verses 12 through 15, we see this passage here and Jesus says, you're my friends. See, this friendship with God is what produces this fruitfulness in our lives. We have this friendship with God, and out of that friendship grows everything that's beautiful that we want in our lives. Everything that we feel like is important for us to have, it comes out of a friendship with God. So what's my message today? Hold on one second. You know what this is right here? It's a hoverboard, 
I've been practicing all week so I don't fall off in front of y'all. You know what this does right here? It takes me places faster with less effort. I can, go, I can go further faster and not expend as much energy as I would if I was just walking myself. This, this is what a friendship with God looks like. A friendship with God is us producing all of this fruit without this extra labor that it requires to get somewhere. Some of us are what Jesus would call tired and weary. We've been working so hard trying to produce all this on our own, and God says, no, 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 just be in a friendship with me. You know what's important about this device, though? It takes me further, faster, but here's, here's the thing. For it to work, you have to lean into it. For it to work, you have to lean into it. Listen, for your friendship with God to work, you've got to lean into this friendship. You've got to hear the teachings of Jesus and say, okay, I'm going to obey it. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to start doing the things that God wants me to do. I'm going to lean into it. For so many of us, we're sitting over here on the side thinking, okay, well, that sounds really good, and I like the ideas of it, but there's no activity on our part to say, okay, I'm going to lean into this. Leaning into this, make time for God every day. Get in the Bible. Read the Word every day. Spend time praying. Get involved in a group that we have at the church church, meet with other believers, come to church regularly. Listen, these aren't activities that produce fruit in your lives. These are activities that encourage a friendship and out of a friendship with God, you will bear fruit. You will have fruitfulness. You will have all these things that you want. And it doesn't happen because you're working real hard and you're striving and you're checking off the religious to-do list. You're doing it because it's an outflow of a friendship. Would you bow your heads with me all across this room? I want to I pray for us. And I want us to have an opportunity to respond to God's message to us today with worship. Maybe you're here today and you, you know I've been far from God. I haven't been in a relationship with him. In fact, maybe there might be some of you today for the very first time, you're going to pray and ask Jesus to come into your life. You're going to pray and ask for God to forgive you of your sin and to remove all of your past and for him to give you a brand new start. Listen, I want to pray with you if that's you today. God wants to do a work in your life where he establishes this brand new relationship in your life. For some of us, it's just been the busyness of life. We've been not making time for this friendship with God and we got to get back to it because it's what fulfills us the most. It's what produces all the things that we really want to have in life. I need to make that time for God. Listen, for some of us, we've been just disobedient. And a friendship with God requires obedience. And we gotta, we gotta repent and turn back to God. Would you stand up with me all across this room? Nobody looking around. Everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed. If that's you and you know, I need to make some things right with God today. Today, I know that I need to make a decision to follow Jesus, and maybe it's for the very first time. If that's you, I want you to just be real courageous and just lift up your hand. I'm not going to ask you to walk to the front or anything else. I just want to know who it is that we're praying for today. If that's you, I need a relationship with God. Would you just slip up your hand all across this room? Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. And you can put it right back down. Listen, I want to pray for you, and I want to pray for all of us. And then we're going to sing this great worship song with this team. We're going to worship God through giving of our tithes and offerings. The containers will be passed in just a moment. You can place your offerings in there. Let's give God our hearts today. Father, today we've heard your message of love to us. God, that you didn't come to throw shade at us. No, no, you came so that we could be your friends. And God, there's some people in this room today that are making a courageous decision to follow Jesus maybe for the very first time. God, today, would you bless your people? God, would you open up the heavens and pour out eternal life on those who are crying out to you for a new start? If that's you today, pray right now. Say, God, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. I believe that Jesus Christ is God's son and he is my way to salvation. Just pray that out of your heart right now. Come on, for the rest of us, just respond to him. What's he saying to you? Just as this song begins to sing in just a moment, let's just begin to lift up our praise to him.
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.